Our focus today is not some grand theological theme. It's not some deep biblical truth. It's not some burning issue in Christian faith and practice. Our focus today is not some grand theological theme. It's not some deep biblical principle. It's not some burning issue in Christian faith and practice. Our focus today is a simple everyday life experience, friendship. So let me share with you five insights this morning on friendship. First of all, we all need friends. We all need friends. Robert Louis Stevenson once said, and I love this quote, friendship is a gift you give yourself. Don't you love that? Friendship is a gift you give yourself. In the late 1970s, Dr. James Lynch, a noted psychologist and then a professor uh, on the John Hopkins School of Medicine faculty, began to study the effects of relationships on loneliness. He became very concerned about what he called the epidemic of loneliness in our country. And so he studied as a psychologist the effect of key relationships in our lives on loneliness. And he came to the conclusion that these key relationships in our lives, including friendship, make all the difference in us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And he went so far to say in a book that he wrote, which was titled The Broken Heart, The Medical Consequences of Loneliness, that key relationships in our lives do four things for us. They strengthen our immune system. They improve our mental health. They heighten our self-esteem and they are natural preventive to loneliness. He said the key relationships of your life and the key relationships of my life, including friend, friendship, strengthen our immune systems, improve our mental health, heighten our self-esteem, and are preventive in our lives to loneliness. You know, the biblical scholars say that Jesus needed and valued friendship, that this one who was the Son of God himself needed and valued friendship, and that's especially clear when you think of the relationship that Jesus had with Mary and with Martha uh, and with Lazarus. You do know, of course, that the shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five, 35, when they record, he wept. Jesus wept. And you know the setting for that, that particular verse, don't you? Lazarus has died. And when Jesus learns about the death of Lazarus, his dear friend, the Gospel of John records... He wept. He wept. As any of us would weep when we lose a dear friend. And what's interesting beyond that verse is John goes on to say that the people who are looking in, watching Jesus cry as he thinks about the loss of his dear friends, John records, see how he loved him. Jesus of Nazareth knew that friends matter in our lives. He valued friendship. He needed friendship. And you and I need friendship. Second insight is, true friendship has certain key qualities. True friendship has certain evident key qualities. I said back in a sermon in February that the Pew Research Center had determined that the average user on Facebook has 245 friends. Again, I said that in a sermon in February. Pew Research Center has said the average one of us who is in any way a, a participant in that social media notice Facebook has 245 friends. Well, I said then and I reiterate today, there is no way in the world that you have or I have 245 people who really meet the criteria of being a real friend in our lives. I came across a wonderful piece recently titled Top 10 Characteristics of True Friendship. Let me share some of them with you. A friend's support is unconditional. When the going gets tough, a friend is right there beside you. A friend has seen you at your worst and loves you anyway. A friend is someone with whom you can share secrets in confidence. You can phone a friend for help even in the middle of the night. Friends want to be bothered when you have a real need. And let me tell you something. If you think somebody's a friend in your life 
and you won't call them at three o'clock in the morning, they're not a friend. I mean, you think about it for a moment. If I ask you to make a list of the people that you consider friends in your life, then I say, now go back to that list and narrow it down to the ones that you would call at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, whatever the need, and they're your real friends. The ones who you feel free calling day or night when you have a need. A friend is honest with you. He or she lovingly deflates your ego without condemning you. And another person spoke to that truth by saying, don't think you're being a friend if you care about, more about my feelings than you do my future. I love that. Don't think you're being my friends if you care more about my feelings than you do about my future. I don't need friends who won't be honest with me. And you don't need friends who won't be honest with you in love. A friend is drawn to you not for what you are, but who you are. And when you share your wildest dreams, a friend is someone who replies, how can I help? What can I do? Instead of saying, are you out of your mind? There may be 245 friends in your Facebook listing, but true friends exemplify certain special, unique qualities, don't they? Third insight, true friendship is a sacred trust. True friendship is a sacred trust. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means two things. It means, first of all, that I understand friendship is a gift from God. I understand that the people in my lives whom I consider real friends are a gift from God to me, to my life. And the people that you can name as real friends in your life are indeed a gift, a personal gift from God to you in your life. I love the statement from the book of James, the first chapter, the 17th verse, where James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heaven. So when you think about those real friends in your life, when you think about the people you can call at three o'clock in the morning, when you think about the people you can depend on, no matter what the circumstances, when you think about the people that concerned about your highs and your lows, when you think about the people with whom you can share a confidence, then you recognize those people are a personal gift from God to you in your life. Now, the second thing about understanding friendship as a tr sacred trust is this. Because it's a sacred trust, because it's a gift from God, I need to nurture it. If it's a sacred trust, if it's a gift from God, then I have responsibility to nurture, to nourish that friendship. I came across a book some years ago. It was written in 2007, and the book was titled, Dear Helga, Helga Dear Ruth, Letters That Bind a Friendship Shattered by History. And let me tell you the story of this book, Dear Helga and Dear Ruth, a friendship uh, bound uh, in shattered history. Helga and Ruth uh, met when they were five years old and in uh, uh, pre-K in Berlin, Germany. And they were dearest friends from the ages of five years old until they were 10 years old. And then when they were 10 years old, their family decided that they had to leave Germany because of the rise of, uh, of, of the Nazi empire in Germany, because of uh, the rule, rule of Hitler. And so Helga's family decided they would flee to Belgium and Ruth's family determined that they would flee to San Diego, Chile, where they had friends. And so there's this scene described in the book when these two little girls are 10 years old and they're at the train station and the mother's already told them to be very careful about their emotions because the soldiers are watching and they don't want any suspicion about what they're about to do. And in the book, it describes that parting scene when, again, they're 10 years old and they're hugging each other, these two little girls. And they say to each other, I love you. I love you. I'll write you. I'll write you. That was 1938. And in 1938, Helga and Ruth were separated. They, their families went to all parts of the globe. And yet for 24 years, they wrote each other several times a year. 
For 24 years, Ruth wrote Helga and Helga wrote Ruth. All over the world. And they kept writing each other. Helga wrote Ruth and Ruth wrote Helga. 24 years. They didn't see each other. And the only contact they had with each other was by letter, but they kept writing each other to nurture and nourish that friendship. And then in 1962, Ruth's husband was coming to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City for a residency, which is where Helga and her husband and children lived. And so after 24 years, Helga and Ruth were reunited for a whole year. And as the book records, that was the only year they didn't write each other. That was the only year they didn't write each other. If I really believe that friendship is a gift from God to me, and you believe that friendship is a gift from God to you, if I believe that I have a responsibility to nourish this relationship, and you believe you have a responsibility to nourish the friendships of your life, then there are certain things we need to do. One, we need to stay in touch. If you value that friendship, stay in touch with that person. Secondly, let the person know that he or she is dear to your life. Express the personal gratitude that that person matters in your life. And thirdly, keep the person informed about the highs and lows of your life. Let them know when you're down and let them know when you're up. Let them know when you've got something to celebrate in your life and let them know when there's great pain in your life. Friendship is a sacred trust, which means that we understand it to be a gift of God and which means we nourish that relationship. Fourth insight, we the church are called to be a place of friendship and hospitality. We, the church, are called to be a place of friendship and hospitality. I don't know if you know the name Ken uh, Miedema or not. I think this congregation probably does know Ken Miedema. I understand from Jim after the 830 service that Ken Miedema has been here a couple of times. Ken Miedema uh, is a musician-songwriter who began writing songs 40 years ago about the Christian life and Christian faith and Christian practice. And he's a noted songwriter in our day and time. And if you've had the privilege of, of uh, reading his songs or hearing him, you've been blessed. Ken Miedema. Well, he's got a wonderful song about the church that's titled, uh, If This Is Not a Place. And I want you to hear the words of Ken Miedema and think about what it means to be the church, which is willing to be a friend to all who come our way. Ken Miedema writes, If this is not a place where tears are understood, where can I go to cry? If this is not a place where my spirit can take wing, where can I go to fly? I don't need another place for trying to impress you with just how good and virtuous I am. I don't need another place for always being on top of things. Everybody knows that it's a sham. I don't need another place for always wearing smiles, even when it's not the way I feel. I don't need another place to mouth the same old platitudes because you and I both know it's not real. If this is not a place where my questions can be asked, where can I go to seek? If this is not a place where my heart cries can be heard, where can I go to speak? If this is not a place where anyone with the deepest questions of life can come, where will they go? If this is not a place where the person who is brokenhearted and struggling in his or her faith cannot come, where will they go? If this is not a place where the person who is going through the most difficult time of his or her life, maybe because of moral choices he or she has made, and they cannot come here, where can they go? If a person is going through a time in his or her life when they believe there is no spiritual rootage for their lives and they can't come here, where can they go? 
I've said before and I say to you again that every single person who walks through the doors of Germantown United Methodist Church should feel from every member of Germantown United Methodist Church the warmth and the friendship of Jesus of Nazareth. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't matter where they've been. It doesn't matter where they are. Every single person who comes into the life of this church, into this sanctuary, into this space, should feel from each of us that they are welcome, that we receive them in the friendship of Jesus of Nazareth. Final insight. Having said that, we need to go out these doors to the lonely in the world. If we're going to be the friends of Jesus, we need to go out these doors to the lonely of the world. I mentioned earlier that James Lynch says that loneliness is epidemic in our day and time. Some of you were here uh, in April when I preached a sermon for the Confirmands, our sixth graders, and as they sat here on these, these front pews, I talked to them about the mission of our church, which was to love God and love others and serve Christ and share Christ and make disciples. And as I was talking to these sixth graders about serving Christ, I, I used an example out of their experience. And I said to them, what does it mean for you, a sixth grader, to serve Jesus? I said, I'll give you a primary example. You're in the lunchroom. And there's a kid sitting over there all by himself or herself at that table. And you've got all your friends around you. And you're laughing, enjoying lunch. And that kid is sitting over there by himself or herself. You know what a Jesus follower does? A Jesus follower gets up and goes to the table where the person sits by himself or herself. Or I said, what if you walk in down the hallway and you see a student in your school and that student's holding, clutching his or her books and, and they're looking down at the, at the, uh, the, the uh, floor. They're not making eye contact with anybody. They're just walking down the hallway, clutching their books, looking down because they don't have anyone who cares about where they are that day, in that space, in that school, at that time. A follower of Jesus goes out of his or her way to befriend that lonely student. Now adults, I said that to sixth graders. There are lonely people at your workplace. There are lonely people in your neighborhood. There are lonely people all around us. And what a sad state of affairs it is for the people called followers of Jesus. If loneliness remains epidemic because we don't seek out the lonely. The world is full of people who need a friend. And for us to be the friends of Jesus means that we are willing to seek out and to befriend the lonely. So again, this is not a sermon on some grand theological matter. It's not a sermon of some deep biblical truth per se. It's not a sermon about a burning issue necessarily in Christian faith and practice. But friendship matters to you, and it matters to me, and it matters to God. We all need friends. And we need not just friends, we need real friends. And remember, friendship is a sacred trust. That means it's a gift from God. That person is a personal gift from God to you. And to honor it, as a sacred trust means we nurture it. And we, the church, should be the place where everyone who walks in these doors feels friendship, hospitality, and warmth. And God calls you and God calls me to leave this place and seek out the lonely who need a friend. Thanks be to God. Amen. I call your attention now to your bulletin, 
to our affirmation of faith for the morning. Let us stand as we...